Some video games just don't quite come together. A bad game is a bad game. But we love video games here at Game Ranks, and to be honest, we strongly believe that sometimes a bad game can still have a teeny tiny kernel of value or something interesting, you know, at least one cool thing worth talking about. So here are some examples of what the majority considers bad games that actually had a cool idea or two within them. Starting off with number 10, let's talk about Anthem. The flying. I mean, I know it's a cliche at this point, but it really is the closest any video game has ever really gotten to the feeling of being Iron Man. They really missed an opportunity by not making the map more open, in our opinion. The flight mechanics are the only reason why we're actually desperately hoping that the IP doesn't totally get abandoned. Maybe they just turned it into something cooler. Because I know it's easy to rag on Anthem now that it's dead and buried. We didn't like it. It was light on content, it had all the bad live service stuff that nobody really asked for, and it just kind of felt unfinished. But weirdly enough, few games have managed to really capture the feeling of flying in a big metal suit of armor like Anthem did. In reality, it's not actually a major part of the game. The only reason you're flying an Anthem is from getting to point A to point B. It's not integrated with the combat very well, but that doesn't really matter because the artists and the animators really pulled out all the stops to at the very least make the flying feel satisfying in a way that almost no other game has really managed to capture. It's kind of wild how flight feels like such an integral part of the game and an afterthought at the same time. It's clearly the best part of Anthem, but it seems like Bioware didn't quite understand what worked about their own game, what they had going for it. Anthem was not good, but there was some potential here and there. You know, it, it's possible they could have made a good sequel if they had doubled down on just flying around and shooting stuff and a good story, but we don't think that's ever gonna happen. Next over at number nine, uh, let's talk about Forspoken. This is a game that has a whole litany of problems. The open world is dull, the story is goofy, the dialogue on the whole can be pretty awkward. Be honest with me. Was this place always this bad or did I bring this shitstorm with me? But if there's one thing that does work about Forspoken, it is kind of the combat. It gets old fast, of course, because of the constantly reused enemies, but where everything else in the game is mediocre at best, the entire magic system is pretty innovative and fun. Once you've got all the powers unlocked, they actually tried something different here. The problem there, though, is that you have to get through most of the game before you get all four magic types unlocked and all the locomotion stuff, which is just way too long for a game as dull as Forspoken is out of the gate. Uh, for people that do manage to actually stick with it, they'll find a combat system with a fair amount of depth and flair that takes some legitimate skill to master, and it does actually look pretty cool when you chain everything together. It's got moments of good stuff. That's it. Uh... Clearly, the combat is what the designers spent the majority of their time working on because it's clearly not the mission design or the open world stuff, which gets pretty tiring after the first few hours. But Forspoken, if we're talking about a third person action combat game that's centered completely around magic, it is fairly creative. It's unfortunate that the rest of the game just kind of dragged it down. Next over at number eight, uh, it took way too long for the Nintendo Wii to get an actual proper first person shooter, you know, with the wand and the motion controls and stuff. But the first one we got was Red Steel and it was an ambitious game, but unfortunately not the best. And it got some pretty bad reviews. But if all Red Steel had was some first person shooting, then there wouldn't be much to talk about. But what actually makes the game interesting is how it uses motion controls for a whole bunch of unique actions, like how you can shoot the gun out of enemy hands and then have them surrender uh, there's also first-person combat that was quite impressive at the time, even if the game was overall a bit slow and awkward to control. Later Switch games like uh, Metroid Prime 3 and that GoldenEye and The Conduit proved to be much more polished experiences. And then, oh, uh, there was Red Steel 2, which was a much better game than the first overall, so we'll say that, but there's something to the original game that remains unique. They really tried to make it feel immersive in a way other Wii shooters didn't, which gave the game some of its best features. It's still not exactly good, but there are some cool ideas here with the motion controls, even if the execution wasn't that great.
Next over at number seven, uh, there's no way around it, man. Resident Evil 6 was a mess, and it's kind of the black sheep of the franchise. And that's a franchise with quite a few black sheep, trust me. Uh, but this is not from a lack of ambition. If anything, it's because Capcom was almost too ambitious here. Four campaigns with cross multiplayer support, each with their own characters who have all their own weapons and abilities. It's maybe the ultimate example of seventh generation console game excess. It's maximalist design at its most bloated and over the top. Now, because of the shotgun approach to game design, it means that certain parts of the game are pretty bad, like the constant cutscenes and on-rail segments that take control of the way from the player, some dull and boring segments, and then uh, the story uh, is mixed. Don't get me started on that. But the other parts are actually pretty good, like the actually quite impressive combat system. Now, going into Resident Evil 6, most people expected it to play just like Resident Evil 4 and 5, and for the most part, it does, but with a lot of added twists, like the way they built on that formula is actually pretty impressive if you look back. There's a quick shot button for shooting enemies instantly at point blank range. There's a dodge button, a dive, a roll. You can aim on the ground and chain together combos. Leon uh, can go guns akimbo for some reason. When you throw all these moves together, the game starts to feel closer to a character action game than Resident Evil. And using all these tools can be so satisfying once you actually understand how it all works. For people playing the game for the first time though, that usually takes a while because the game does nothing to encourage you to really try and use all this stuff to its maximum potential. There's no denying that certain parts of Resident Evil 6 can be really just an unfun slog. It's still one of the weakest entries, but the way they took Resident Evil 4 and Resident Evil 5 gameplay, like the way that combat felt and made it more action heavy, was kind of impressive. Next over at number six, the 2008 reboot of Alone in the Dark has got to be one of the most inexplicable games ever. It's a mess, you know, 100%, but it's a very interesting mess, one that you couldn't help but look at. Like, the game has so many odd choices for its gameplay, from the bizarre inventory system to the weirdly complex car controls. Alone in the Dark is a game that feels like an evolutionary dead end for video games. There are so many unique mechanics that just disappeared with this game. Now, some people may praise the impressive physics simulations and the fire effects, but at least now that stuff has been done better in other games in 2023. The one feature that remains almost exclusive to this game that I think is legitimately awesome is the DVD style menus. On the main screen, you can scroll through every major moment in the story and start the game from any point, even before beating the game. If you want, you can just skip to the end and there's nothing stopping you. Some people might accuse the game of including this feature because of uh, the persistent freezing and all the technical bugs, but hey, that's probably at least part of it. The game does freeze a lot for no reason. I'm not trying to say like the game is good here, folks. It's very busted, you know, there's no denying that. But many games have chapter selects, but this one is different and it gives you a lot more control and freedom regarding where you are in the story. It's a feature that when played around with could be present in way more games and made pretty fun, especially story-driven games where it's probably not all that hard to implement. But we don't know, we're just arm sharing, so let's move on. Over at number five, uh, the PS3, Xbox 360 era was flooded with generic third-person shooters with some desperate gimmicks to get people in the door. And you know, they were charming, but a lot of them were just forgettably bad. However, Mindjack had a pretty cool gimmick. In it, you can hack into pretty much anything in the arena and have it fight for you. That doesn't just mean that like they turn on their allies, you actually can control them directly, which is pretty fun when you hijack something powerful. While you're controlling the drone, uh, your character continues to act as an AI, and while they're not the brightest, they tend to protect themselves all right, so it's usually better to start hijacking stuff as much as possible because the game lets you go hog wild with it. Go jump in that thing, don't worry about your main character, the AI's got it covered. It's a legitimately cool mechanic, but like a lot of these games, there's just not much else going on behind that. Uh, the story is nonsense, the graphics were rough then, 
the gameplay isn't so hot, and the shooting unfortunately was kind of weak. It's just not very fun to play, but the whole mechanics of making enemies work for you is fun. It's been done in other games before, but it's normally a lot more limited than what you'd get here. It's hardly a great game, but they were onto a good idea with that. Next over at number 4, let's talk about Hydrophobia. This 2010 action game has exactly one memorable thing about it, but it's, it's a doozy. I'm talking about the water effects, of course, which still look pretty damn impressive even now. That's This level of physics simulation for liquid just isn't something you normally see in games. That's not either heavily scripted or totally pre-made. Well, the water effects you see here are actually the real deal. So opening a door and watching the water come flooding in is really dang cool. You gotta admit. The rest of the game, well, is barely there, with some weak shooting and unresponsive platforming, but the water effects really, uh, <laughs> buoy the whole experience. It's not a great game to play, really, but it is cool because they really did manage to do some impressive procedural things with this water that I don't think I've ever seen in another game since then. Like, stuff like this feels truly next-gen in a way pure polygon counts never will. And while we're not saying that hydrophobia is some triumph in game design, the water is pretty sweet. i just like to see some of these effects in a better game. Now over at number 3, another seemingly generic third person shooter from 2010, Dark Void. Its claim to fame was the jetpack. It's sort of like Anthem if the actual flying didn't feel quite as good, but you could actually fight enemies. This is a really impressive feature of the game. So during certain missions, you can freely transition from dogfighting with your jetpack to hovering over a battlefield and then landing for some third person shooting. This is all done seamlessly, and it feels really good to do. I guess I could just bash him over the head with it. If that was the entire game, then it'd probably be better remembered, but it isn't. You know, most of the game is really just boring old third-person shooter stuff from that time period. You never really get a chance to cut loose, but when you do, it can feel kind of short. I don't know if this is a game let down by the hardware of the era or uh, the, the design team's limited imagination. I, I don't know, but Dark Void is a game that could have been really great because they were onto something with that seamless dogfighting stuff. Now down to number two, let's talk about Never Dead. Here's the thing with this game, uh, its central mechanic sucks. It's so incredibly annoying to be running around and suddenly explode into a bunch of pieces. So now you have to awkwardly roll around to reattach your limbs before you get permanently killed because you're like a zombie guy. It, it's annoying though, it, it's tedious and dumb and poorly implemented. It's like the game is custom built to be as annoying as possible to the player. It's almost hostile how random and frustrating this whole thing can feel. It, it's terrible, but in theory, it is a really cool idea. I mean, the basic premise is that it's an action game where you play as a protagonist that's immortal. They cannot be killed, but they can lose all their body parts until they're just ahead. And if a certain enemy manages to suck your head up, then it's game over. In the meantime, you have to detach certain body parts to solve puzzles and get around barriers, which is a fun idea that's been done a little bit here and there and better in a couple of games. But being able to take off body parts and use them as tools and being immortal are really interesting ideas on paper. It's a fantastic idea that could have made for a great game, and it occasionally does feel pretty clever, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, it's mostly just annoying. Anyone seen a left leg lying around? Now down to number one, let's talk Bionic Commando from 2009. This is the one with the, uh, uh, some people call it the hot dog arm and the more dreadlocked Spencer. This is pre-Spider-Man Sunset Overdrive. Uh, just the grappling mechanics and fighting super high up were really fun. The story was awful. Don't get me started with that twist. Uh, there was an ever-present fog that limited your freedom, but still, we played the hell out of it. Relay Station 21 has been activated in Sector Echo Niner. Do we have a signal? Over.
Like we weren't kidding about the late 2000s, early 2010s, having a ton of generic, but kind of charming third person shooters with a gimmick and uh, Bionic Commando seemed like an odd choice for a reboot, but you know, the one thing they really nailed is that swinging mechanic. In this game, you've got the bionic arm that can grapple onto things. You can either pull yourself up or swing around like Spider-Man. If Spider-Man had like a machine gun and was like a soldier man, it's just so much fun to swing around these perilous environments while blasting at bad guys. There really is the recipe for something awesome here. Unfortunately, like so many other games on this list, there's a good central mechanic, but the rest of the game doesn't live up to it. At least here you do get to swing around a bit. It's just that the game is painfully short and extremely linear with a frankly terrible story. The soundtrack is pretty good at least, and the swinging stays fun throughout the entire game. The bionic arm from Bionic Commando is fantastic as an idea. We, we just wish it was in a better game. But those are some cool ideas in bad games. We got one extra one for you that we couldn't fit into the top 10. It's 50 Cent Blood on the Sand. In this game, it's 50 Cent, and he really wants a crystal skull that someone paid him for, for some reason. Look, the game is dumb as hell, and the developers know it, and they embrace it. There's no other explanation for this. The swear button, a button with only one purpose. It makes 50 Cent say the bad words. <laughs> you can even unlock more vulgar swear packs using money you earn in the game. I'd complain, but you know these days, it'd probably be DLC or something. The only way to truly play this iconic and ironic masterpiece is to spam the swear button constantly. Press it more than you're pressing the shoot button. It's utterly stupid and pointless, but it is so funny. Yo, we need to team up on this shit. I can boost you up. Let's move. Let's go. Anyway, those are some good ideas in some kind of unfortunately bad video games. This could really be an endless series. So we'd love to hear you guys in the comments. Just like, do you have any other games that you really didn't like, but there was one really cool idea in it? There's so much out there. So let us know in the comments. But if you like this video and you like what we do every day, we're just chatting about games. Clicking the like button helps us very much. Thank you for being here, but we'll see you guys next time.